Hello, everyone. Welcome to Libraries in Response. This is session 111 since we started in March of uh, 2020, right after the pandemic was declared as a, well, as a response to the, to the, to the global catastrophe that, that, uh, that the COVID pandemic represented. It changed our lives overnight. Everybody, it changed civilization overnight. Nothing has ever changed everything so fast. Not world wars, they take months and maybe years, but this just happened all at once. And it's still happening. It's still reverberating through through cultures and economies and so forth. So uh, our initial reply, response, reaction really uh, was, okay, now that everything is closed, what is, what is a library if the building is closed? It's not nothing, but what? And so that started a conversation that just kept rolling. And it was right not long after that, then the social crisis that was triggered by the, the Floyd murder, and then the economic crisis, and then the political crisis. And then there's always a pervasive climate crisis. And then most recently, we've had a crisis that's being introduced by this uh, new information technology, AI, whatever it is and whatever it means that we've spent a lot of time on, and it's been a very, very popular topic. Uh, so today, um, I know a lot of you have are filled up with uh, political commentary and uh, uncertainty. Uh, when we when we announced the session on Monday, uh, certainly there was uncertainty. Uh, there's less uncertainty today. There's still a ton of it. Uh, our guest is uh, Cal, uh, Kevin Cal Callagher, uh, cartoonist for the Baltimore Sun and The Economist, uh, of which I am a longtime fan and reader. And uh, this, this is, I think, about a year old, this uh, cartoon uh, up there that it took me a couple of minutes to see it. I, you know, I just couldn't see that there were extra hurdles. For the female figure, but I did get it, and I, I, I thought it was uh, clever, like so many of uh, the really successful cartoons are. And and what are they, and what are the role that in 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 the social political conversation? That's what we're going to talk about today with Cal. Thank you. Uh, we'll get to that. We are if you can give it the libraries network. We're an open consortium of libraries doing what we think are interesting things with technology uh, anywhere. And uh, we are hosted and recorded today by our longtime partner, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions based in The Hague. Uh, IFLA is an association primarily made up of national libraries and national library associations around the world. So it's a vehicle for connecting the roughly 400,000 public libraries in the world and another two and a half million school libraries. Not that they're all so active in this, but it's a vehicle for communicating through those existing networks to those facilities and to those communities. Um, we have for a long time worked on the notion that every community should have a library or every community should have at least some kind of a uh, access hub for information and communication in the internet age it's just it, indispensable so uh, that's been a long time work a number of years doing that and our, our series sponsor this year is IMLS the Institute for Museum and Library Services uh, based in DC it's a small federal agency but they do great work uh, supporting the state library agencies is their number one uh, contribution like 80% of their budget goes to that. And then the rest of it is to run the agency. And then they also do individual grants, one of which we have, which is uh, helping libraries in response operate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our speaker, Cal, uh, a political cartoonist, as I mentioned, with Baltimore Sun and The Economist, where I have been getting his, uh, his communications and lamenting the fact that... Um, you need to subscribe to to see these. They, they should be they should be. I don't want to say public domain, but they should be more available to everyone to uh, see this great artwork and insights. And I'll talk a little more about Cal when we get there. Uh, Cal being his uh, his professional pen name. 
Uh, this is a composite that we pulled together, a kind of a, a historical uh, representation of political cartooning. The the join or die is actually a Ben Franklin. Uh, it's it's uh, attributed to be kind of the the first political cartoon, but not the first cartoon. No, they go way back. Uh, they were you know cavemen were doing uh, images, uh, representational images, uh, you know, long time ago. Uh, the one in the middle, upper middle there, is uh, by the, the French cartoonist Damier, and this is Napoleon and whoever was uh, running England at the time, carving up the world uh, in, in their imperial uh, dining room there. And then on the right, that's uh, uh, that's Thomas Nast doing Boss Tweed. Uh, it's uh, maybe the most famous political cartoon that we know about, or I grew up knowing about, uh, was, was Nast. But there, these are not the only ones. And then we have a great one by uh, Cal there, which is uh, I think a couple of years old now. It was not long after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and uh, things were not looking very good for for the Russian bear. And what impressed me about this is not just the kind of the power of the drawings and the the message that comes through. You know, here little Taiwan in a bull ready to fight. You know, in war, and this is a kind of skeleton, but uh, it's the it's the Chinese dragon. And and not only the Chinese dragon, but the the gesture, you know, he's holding his chopstick chopsticks perfectly, and even extending his little pinky, you know. I, I don't know why this stuff just gets me. And that's been these have been the images for the countries that uh, Cal has used in a number of different times. So uh, uh, this is drawn from a uh, a paper that is. Uh, uh, the brief history of uh, political cartooning. Uh, I'll drop it into the chat here in a moment. A single humorous satirical drawing employing distortion for emphasis, often accompanied by a caption. So we made the point in the invitation that uh, images are, you know, they, they predate text, of course, and uh, the alphabet and written words by a long time. And uh, the neuroscience points out how much more quickly the brain digests an image than it does uh, uh, written words. And that represents uh, an entry point into people's brains, perceptions, that is a, uh, creates an opportunity for impressions and uh, influence, which I guess is the, the purpose of uh, political cartooning. Uh, they do have the power, this is kind of their, their history, is uh, the power to deflate hubris, uncover, uncover deceit, incite revolution, and dethrone a bully. Now, that's the power to do it. That doesn't mean that they always do that. But if you look back, they're always skewering the powerful. And this is uh, just the delight to, to people in general to see uh, powerful people full of themselves being lampooned uh, by these images that really stick in the imagination. And so that sentence saying that, you know, you could probably remember that. You could probably remember some essence of it, but the exact phrase would be very difficult to memorize without actually spending some time to think about it. But if there were a single image, like the one we had of, uh, of Boss Tweed here, you know, you would keep that. That would stick in your head and you could pull it out. Tweed, uh, who routinely bribed officials to indulge his crime, recognized Thomas Nass was a threat. You know, stop those pictures. I don't care how much the papers write about me. My constituents can't read, but damn it, they see pictures. And in fact, that's true. And uh, they did try to, uh, you know, encourage Nass to move to England uh, and, and stop with the damn pictures. But he refused. He stayed on the job and Boss Tweed ended up dying in jail. This... Uh, I just pulled this one up. This is topical and timely, but it's actually eight years old. Uh, and yet here we are uh, back again for another round of who knows what. Uh, this we've used a number of times. Uh, you'll be familiar with this. Uh, it's the one that really captures for us the essence of libraries and response. 
that uh, the, that the poor world is longing for the good old days and merely worrying about nuclear annihilation was the only thing on on its mind. And now we have the the new four horsemen of the apocalypse here hammering down on it, uh, the pandemic and uh, AI and the climate, of course, and then now war is really not just a distant memory or a remote occasional thing, but it's pretty pervasive uh, as as it is at different levels of political uh, confrontation. Uh, our, our view is that the world needs libraries to support it. Imagine there's a network, a global network of libraries, community libraries all surrounding the world there, helping it hold back these uh, uh, the, these challenges and these crises. It, it, it's, it's really what libraries do. Like it or not, people show up at the library in a disaster or a crisis for help. And if you're ready, great. If you're not ready, well, you, you'll have to respond anyway because that's what librarians do. Uh, COVID was the thing that launched this. Uh, and then, of course, this is always around. These are just snapshots of different kinds of devastations caused by different types of uh, intense extreme weather events, climate-driven weather events uh, that are increasing and are our future. Um, you know, it, it doesn't... Stopping the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere is absolutely an essential thing, but it will not stop this. It's already too late to stop what's happened uh, and and how long it will take and whatever methods there may be to turn that back, we don't know. But the point is uh, mitigation is a is a giant kind of a uh, of an action and it, it takes the response of the of the largest national governments and the largest financial institutions to really turn that. Uh, but, uh, the, the, the companion to response to this, uh, mitigation is adaptation and that's totally scalable. That goes all the way down to the individual, the house, the community, and that's where, uh, libraries can come in to help their communities be more resilient, uh, create redundant strategies for communication and, and electrification. Uh, just having a single point of, uh, uh, hardened access where you've got backup power and a communication link in a community in a time of, you know, these are lights out. These are big scale events and the power goes out for days, if not weeks, sometimes months. And so having a point of communication is extremely valuable. The first thing people want to know in a big scale event with the, the power out, the communications out is where is everybody? Where, where, where's my family, my friends? And, and this is the kind of information people will pay anything for. And so having a vehicle for that is super valuable. On any other given day, yeah, no big deal. But on that day, it's super. Uh, this is a, just an image. Again, we're, we're talking images today, talking with images today, a little bit of verbal uh, accompaniment. Uh, and, and this, I thought, kind of captured the the chaos and the, and the, the horrors of a little bit. It's not the massive destruction we've seen, but you know, this is, this is not what we want. Uh, and this is, this is fresh. This is absolutely fresh. This is today's uh, uh, cartoon uh, in the uh, economist. I don't know if it's been published yet, but anyway, this is uh, our, our fourth horseman of the apocalypse here, AI. And I thought this was really clever. People have been, talking about you know how great it is and of course what a what a what a terror it, it may be we just don't know uh but that's not stopping us or even slowing us down from going full speed ahead and and developing it and turning it loose whatever uh, the consequences may be it seems humans are just compelled to do whatever they can do not whatever they should do it's the it's the nature of technology and uh, I, I don't know that, we, that humans have ever created a technology that there wasn't an evaluation of its potential as a weapon. Uh, and nearly always it's figured out that there is some way to use it. AI is one of those. It just, it may be more than, it, a lot of people talk about it as a tool, but tools really don't make decisions about, you know, what nail they're going to hit or what city they're going to bomb. They they're directed by by humans 
AI has a potential to direct itself. That is different. So this great cartoon, this is an image that we've used here. Libraries are, uh, and this is just kind of a comparison with uh, the, the, the notion of, of uh, images and text. We, uh, we gathered some quotes, uh, you know, finished that sentence, the libraries are what, uh, from several non-librarians who've been speakers. And they came back with really stimulating responses. Here's a list of them, event servicing, they're bastions of democracy, Reed Hunt, you know, multi-service public facilities, Deb Fallows, the wonderful uh, writer for uh, The Atlantic, and, and I guess a colleague of Cal, uh, Promoters of Democracy, and uh, Corey uh, Doctorow, Last Secular Institution, uh, Bill McKibben, probably the number two most famous uh, uh, eco-warrior behind Greta Thunberg. Libraries are magical. So the point is that these are, this, these are phrases, these is text, and the they may stick as memes, which are powerful and can stick, but they can't be very long. But you still have to decode this in a way that you don't when you're looking at an image. So that's what we're going to hear about today from Cal Culliger, uh, Colliger, I think it is, and uh, his his career uh, as a, as a cartoonist. How, how he how he got started, how he pulls these together, he gets ideas, and again, it's not just the great art; it's also the insight. You know, to see something in a situation that can be brought to visual reality in a way that's compelling. So all of that has to come together to make a successful cartoon, which Cal is absolutely a master at. And so, with that. I am going to stop the share and say welcome, Cal. And we're welcome. so we're so pleased and happy to have you. And take it away. Well, oh, first of all, thanks a lot, Don, for um, uh, for inviting me. And also, it was very uh, useful for me to hear the introduction and so on. At libraries, of course, it's very special places. So, if I was to put a sentence to follow, what are libraries? I would say they are islands of truth in a typhoon of disinformation. Wow. And so this is where we kind of come to. Notice I use a visual metaphor because I'm very fond of those. So I'm gonna, for, for those who are out there, I wanna invite you into my office, my studio. And it's, so it's great to have you here. And what I thought I'd do today is um, chat a little bit, show some cartoons, have a few giggles, but I want to spend a lot of time taking questions from you guys. The Q&As are always, always the most interesting bits because those are where I'm getting to the straight to the heart of the things that interest you guys. So um, why don't we, I'll, I'll get cracking on this for a little bit. I got some slides. I'll just run through some cartoons for you. And these will be more about, you know, giving you, giving you guys some insight into the cartoon world. Um, particularly the political cartoon world. Um, as Don mentioned before, there's different kinds of cartoons. So somebody, when I when I show up at the airport, they say, what do you do? Oh, I'm a cartoonist. Well, in their mind, I could be a person who does comic strips or I could be doing uh, comic books or I could be just doing funny little um, tidbits that you see on, on the front of greetings cards. But the political cartoonist, Wow, that's a whole nother thing. In fact, I, I like to call the political cartoonist the decathlon athlete of the cartoon world because you have to be um, a journalist first. We were keeping up with all the things that are going on in the world. Uh, next, you have to be a commentator, like a columnist, where you're taking the information you have, then you have to form an opinion that you're going to share with people. Then you put on the hat of a satirist, which is basically taking the commentary that you want to have, delivering it with humor. And then the last thing you are is an artist. So you're delivering this, you know, satirical commentary in pictures. So really all of those skill sets are complicated and are right. Put them all together. That's what you've got for a political cartoon. And it's one of the reasons why there's so few of us. 
The second reason why there's so few of us is that the cartooning world had an event for us that was like kind of uh, the uh, kind of the virus uh, for you guys. What do you you know? Uh, how do you respond to this? Well, for us, of course, it was the internet because it basically um, threatened all newspapers which are the natural home of cartoons. It has been for several centuries. And so today it's a little, just as a little indication, um, back in about 20 years ago, uh, we have an annual gathering of cartoonists, you know, a couple of hundred cartoonists get together, talk business. As you can imagine by the end of this four days, your face is hurt from smiling so much and laughing so much. But the, um, the thing was, is that you know, two decades ago, we would have had 200 plus people attending that um, convention. We had our convention about three weeks ago today, of which we also shared with the Canadians, and we had a total of 30 because of the amount of people who were uh, um, doing it, it shrunk dramatically. I remain one of the only um, full-time cartoonists that was operating, and probably maybe the, you know in the world in the world there's a you know same sort of issues are going on. Now that's not to say, however, that visual satire and cartoons are dead, because right now cartoons are appearing more places than ever before, thanks to the internet. My cartoons, uh, you know, I, I finished a cartoon and may appear in the Economist and get a, hundred, a million people viewing it there, but it could be real, viewed by another two to five million on other pl uh, places on, on the internet. Now, where the rub is, is how do you get paid for that, right? And I'm lucky because I have got employers who are helping me along the way. Um, but it also means that uh, in my business of satire, uh, the bar has been lifted because all the low hanging fruit of easy ideas and easy jokes is being taken up with memes and by people uh, on social media doing their own takes on things. It's a, if you're going to be paid for it, like I'm getting to be paid, you've got to deliver something that's special that nobody else can do. And that's getting increasingly hard in this environment. All right. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to try to share with you um, some slides here. Let me get to the share window here, guys. Let me see if I can get to Keynote. Here we go. And uh, I'm going to get cracking on this. And let's see um, if this is working out here. All right. Let's see. Hold on, guys. Yeah. Just a second. Play. And just trying to follow. Oh, there it is. Play. OK. There we go. Great. So I'm going to get this little thing out of the way here. OK. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, you know, a little bit of what cartoon is, it, life is like, is that, you know, you have your one weapon, the pen, and you're having, the pen is, can be deemed to be mightier than the sword, but this is that you have to go up against everybody and all of their, uh, and all of their grandmothers um, every day when you sit down. So I want to show you this cartoon because this is the first cartoon that I ever did. You showed Thomas Nass and some of these other guys. This is a cartoon that I did when I was six years old. And thank you from my mom for keeping this. Um, it's Lincoln at Gettysburg and um, you know, the Gettysburg Address and all that stuff. And the reason why I'd like to show people this cartoon, partly because it's always interesting to see people's early work and where they started, but also I want you to look at the sun for a moment. So the sun is this kind of ball of fire with lines coming out. And why that's important is that cartoon is what we do is we take stuff that can't be handled in any other way and put lines in it to try to use that as our form of um, um, communicating with folks. And so as we look in your, wherever you are, look at the sun, it doesn't have lines around it. And I think that the instinct for mankind since the beginning has always been to try to take complex situations in the world and be able to turn them into lines. We find that, of course, in the cave paintings and in France and Spain, you see them in the, uh, oh, and in, in deep within the pyramids the, several thousand years ago, you see these line drawings. So anyways, I believe that all of us, everyone who's on this call has the potential to be a cartoonist. Because when you were six, when I did this, everyone at age six is drawing, but happened, something happens between the age six and 16 that knocks them off of that platform. And I believe that it, it can be brought back. It's partly because it's like a language, uh, you know, learning a foreign language. And um, you may not, I, I cannot tell you that you'll be a 
professional cartoonist, but it's a little bit like learning a new foreign language, like French, Spanish, whatever. And then I can't tell you that you're going to be a poet in that world with that new language. But I think that in drawing, I can turn you to a competent drawer. And so everything you're going to see here, think about maybe you could draw this too sometime. So we, I've been with The Economist for, you know, uh, 47 years. And I've done over 11,000 cartoons in my career, but including over 150 magazine covers. And then, you know, one of the things is that during my career, I think I've covered every single important story over the past five decades in the, in the globe. And of course, drawing so many American politicians who tend to be the center of things. Now, I mentioned to you earlier, guys, that I'm here in Baltimore. That's where my um, studio is now. But I lived in the UK for 11 years. And The Economist is a global publication based in London, but has nearly half of its circulation here in the United States. And so you can see there's a lot of a lot of uh, different characters and every politician comes forward somehow provides new um, uh, new material. Uh, this cartoon I like because it's um, uh, this cartoon has no words to it. It was on the cover of The Economist. I think Hurricane Hugo had just come in. Well, at the same time that the Bush administration seemed to be buffered with all sorts of um, issues around the world. And so I thought that was a perfect sam uh, sample. So um, caricature is an important part of being a, a political cartoonist. You got to get good at um, capturing the, your politicians in uh, a distorted fashion. And you use it as a tool um, to help um, uh, multiply your, your message that you're trying to do. And a perfect example, because I want to show you, this is Barack Obama. You guys might remember when he first came into office, you know, he was taut skin, black hair. His teeth were this, a color that doesn't exist in nature. They're so bright. Um, but then after a few years, this is what he looked like, right? So it was the, what I like to call uh, the gravity and gravitas working on the face to pull it apart. When I'm drawing my faces of my car, of my characters, some of who I've drawn thousands of times, I fill my screen, my, my computer screen, with photos of them, most recent photos, because everyone's face is constantly changing. And when you're president, your face changes exponentially. So this caricature, clearly different photos than the ones that I used for the first one. Oh, we got Dick Cheney here. So we do presidents, we do vice presidents. You might remember with Dick Cheney had a little bit of a hunting accident. And uh, this is that cartoon that's something to do then. And then there's his daughter, right? Liz Cheney, who is um, gone into the center of the conversation in a big way. So there are some characters, of course, that are living, walking, and talking cartoons. It makes it a little bit easier in that way. Um, but at the same time, like I said, we have to do stuff that's a little bit more insightful to be successful over time. Because every time that you open up a, a paper or a magazine or you, you, you click on something, if it's a cartoon, you may only spend five seconds reading it, maybe 10 seconds. But we, it, it's such a valuable part of your time. I've got to reward you for that investment that you've made. And if I just do the same old of everybody else, then you're going to click on, and the next time, guess what? You may not click. Uh, looks like, oh, this is a, a, an early Joe Biden giving the State of the Union address and Kevin McCarthy behind him not being so happy. Oh, and then this is Hunter Biden. We talked about um, Liz Cheney. Now this is the president's um, son and the way he's uh, being captured by the, uh, by the Republicans at the time. So this cartoon for me, I like because this kind of tells the story of Washington today, where there seems to be more pointing of fingers than opening of ears. And uh, I love this because it uses a tool that I call the visual pun, which is where you have two images that look the same, put them together, give you something different. So in this case, you have hands that pointing hands, but that you roll them into uh, the face of the, of the creatures, then um, it, it, there's a good crossover there. And so I'm going to show you some tools that the cartoon have to use. All right, this is a, one of my favorite cartoons. What foreign enemies thinks Americans are looking for, world control. What Americans are really looking for is remote control. And so what, what I love about this cartoon, it's got two panels, all right? So we're using a couple tools here. Number one, Uncle Sam, national figure. These are used a lot in cartoons. We have the Russian bears you, you talked about before and the 
and the Chinese dragon, Uncle Sam, of course, being very famous symbol, because that's a shorthand. It allows the cartoon to, to create something easy for the audience to come in and understand a whole point that you're trying to make by using these visual shorthands. Um, what I also like about this cartoon is it uses two panels. So some of the cartoons you're going to see here have multi-panels. Some of them are going to be very simple. And the reason you have to use two panels is that you can't get the whole story into one panel. But more importantly, in this case, you get a timing. You get the setup in the first panel, the payoff in the second panel. And so that pacing for humor purposes is important. But then it also gets it helps you with your point as well. Oh, and that's another one of my Uncle Sam cartoons here. People of Cuba, why stick with that dictator idiot Castro when you can freely elect your idiots like we do? So I love this cartoon because I was in Cuba in 1999. Um, and I, when I, I came back, there was a, a whole sorts of mess in the U.S. with um, uh, Bill Clinton and all that stuff. And so this was the perfect cartoon after my time in Cuba. So I'm going to show you a cartoon going back to the, the panel that this cartoon has got five panels in it. And in five panels, it tells the full story of U.S. foreign policy um, after 9-11. OK, and people remember that time. Right. And um, what happened first, of course, we saw um, Afghanistan. We're going to go in there. We have to deal with it. Right. But what happens is turns out not to be as easy as we thought it would be. But then next we see Iraq. This is the real big problem. We got a bigger stick this time. We're about to hit Iraq and oh dear, bigger problems ensue. But finally, maybe about 2019, we see Syria as a problem, but we've kind of learned our lesson a little bit on how we're going to deal with uh, the problems that we face there. So what brings you here, miss? She says, Taiwan. So we got the, we got the dragon. We've got the bear. And what I love about this is notice the divide between the top and the bottom. We have all of that land and those interesting plants and so on. So it's like having two panels, but you're having it in one panel. And that is to try to get what I call visual timing, which is using the picture tools itself to guide your eyes to deliver the point. Okay, airport security. I haven't... I haven't seen these for a little while, so I like to enjoy look at my old cartoons. They go, oh, that's pretty good. So here's the airport security. This is a cartoonist, by the way, going through airport security. We've all been through this. You're patting yourself down. Then the next thing you know, they're going to start shaking us. Then you got the mind readers. You got the tumble scanners. You got the last stretch. And then finally, the guy says, now you can feel safe. And I say the part of me that I can still feel. So that's something that we can all identify with. So this cartoon I'm going to show you, this is my most famous cartoon. Did back in 1989, long time ago. It's called Just a Normal Day at the Nation's Most Important Financial Institution. So a guy on the left, you can see him. He's saying, I've got a stock here that could really excel. Really excel, 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 sell, 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 sell. Here he's on at the bottom, sell, 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 sell. This is madness. I can't take anymore. Goodbye. 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 Bye, 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 bye. And then at the bottom right, you can see a guy there. I've got a stock here that could really excel. So do this cartoon, 1989. And it gets picked up in some places, but then it starts to appear in Paris and in South Africa and in, in, um, in Asia. And I start getting phone calls from stockbrokers from all around the world. And they say two things. First, they'd like to have a copy of the cartoon. And number two, they say in a whisper, this is exactly what it's like. So when I knew that, I wasn't laughing so hard at the cartoon. But that's that's the way things go. What will the warrior guardian of the future look like? Yo, dude, back here. OK, so remember we talked about the visual timing? Perfect here. When your eyes land in this cartoon, I took them for a little walk. Giant figure in the middle, pointing up to the northwest corner of the cartoon. That was me directing your eyeballs up there. And then you saw the words beneath, the big Q. You went down there. Um, 
question yourself and then you start looking for an answer. You're curious, interest, interested people. So you went all the way around and there you saw the words and then you saw the words down to his arm, down to his body, down to his feet, the cybersecurity the payoff. If you'd seen cybersecurity at the front, at the beginning, it would have ruined the whole cartoon. Instead, I took your guys on a little travel. I think that's their combined ages. So one thing that is, um, you know, we when Joe Biden was running and while he was still in the uh, race, everyone was talking about his age. People haven't talked about that much with Donald Trump, but it's going to really show itself over the next four years. Oh, here's here's some cartoons that people were saying about Joe Biden. Um, and, you know, I was calling for him not to run back in, in a year ago. I said, don't run again. You know, let it go. And of course, let's see here we are. All right, this is one I'm again one of my favorites here. So you guys might remember Donald Trump met with Vladimir Putin back in the second year of his first administration, and um, people were always wondering what they were actually talking about. Well, I want to tell you, I've got a transcript of his meeting with with Putin here, and this is what happened. Putin says, "Hello, Donald. I hacked your last election, attacking your most defining national institution." And this time I'm going to do it with what only with more precision. And Trump's response was, you had me at hello. So I think that uh, what I love about this is the caricatures of the two characters and the way they're looking at each other. And then, of course, the payoff with the uh, kickoff line. Cal? Yeah. You go back to that? Sure. I, it's something you captured that uh, I had seen and I just, I don't know, it puzzles me, but... <clears throat> Trump seems to always sit forward like that. You never, you never see him sit back. I guess it's because he doesn't want to show a large, you know, stomach. That makes sense. Uh, but his hands, he uses that hand gesture all the time. And what, what is that? I've never seen anyone do that. It looks well, like, one of the things, you know, when, when you're a cartoonist, you try to pay attention to a lot of things. So a caricature, people automatically assume a caricature is about their face. And of course, faces are one of the main areas that we, communicate with people. But the caricature is also about the whole body and the way they carry themselves and the way that they use their hands. And everyone is unique the way they do it. I remember when I was working in the UK, Margaret Thatcher, prime minister for about a decade when I was there, and all the caricatures of her had were with this long pointy nose. But one of the funniest things was is that she did not have a long nose. But what happened was is that she walked a little bit hunched with her, her, her chin outstretched. And so gave the impression that everything was la launching forward. So that body helped describe what who she was in her face. So the same way with this is that I always notice that Donald Trump likes to do these kind of things. And so I often, when I have him talking to people, he's doing things like that. Um, and Vladimir Putin has got more hunched. He's like his shoulders come out of his ears. So that's um, something I'm, I'm always looking for all those other hints, not just the ones that seem obvious. It may be repressed, but it actually, uh, not to be crude, but it, it looks like a female body part. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Maybe that's why people pay attention to more. So so um, this next page is, is, you know, when you're a cartoonist like I am, you have to touch on delicate subjects. And there's nothing more delicate in the US presently than guns. And, you know, I lived in the UK for 11 years where the attitude toward guns is quite different than it is here in the United States. Um, and I wanted to show you guys this cartoon. I did this cartoon over 20 years ago after there had been a school shooting, I think in Oregon at the time. And this cartoon says, kids shooting kids. It's happening more and more. We must find a way to stop it. But what can we do? And the person on the far end says, maybe we should, Americans should get rid of our guns. And the last panel is all the people have got guns. And he goes, just a thought, just a thought. So the uh, you do these kind of subjects um, and they're going to get yourself. As you know, we are living in a very strongly emotive um, time, deeply divided country. Every time you do a cartoon, you're going to piss somebody off. And you often hear about it. 
probably 80%, 85% of my contact with the public is negative. People who are writing, calling, they don't fax so much as they used to, but they um, emailing particularly um, uh, with something nasty to say about what you do. And there's a lot of reasons to that. I think if people agree with you, they don't tend to write and sort of saying, good job. That's I'm, I'm the same. I see something great. I don't often let everybody know. Um, so that could be part of it. But it's also, I think that there's um, more of a permission for people to feel that they can vent their uh, frustration in public at you. Here's a cartoon about religion, another delicate subject, okay? Hello, Lord Almighty's office. Michael the Archangel speaking, may I help you? And this is an older cartoon. Who is it? Pope John Paul II on the line. Again? He's worried about this movement to ordain women as priests. But I've already told him what I think. Tell him I'm busy. I'm sorry, she's busy right now. <laughs> so this is this cartoon, of course, is not a controversial religious cartoon. But anytime you delve into that area, you're walking, uh, you're dancing through a minefield. Uh, and then here's a cartoon that I did some years ago. Never will go out of date. And this is, of course, before the act events of last October seventh. The uh, you know, it's the it's the uh, you know the cycle re revenge, as you can see. This one I like because it's a great visual but it also tells a you know, complicated story. So back to religion for last cartoon here about religion. And this is um, you know, a cartoon that I did some time ago about, again, something that could be perceived in, in the Middle East. And it says, it all started with an argument over whose God was more peace-loving, kind, and forgiving. So a little dark humor, another kind of tool that we use in cartooning. Sometimes you use big, beautiful gag cartoons. Sometimes you use caricature. Sometimes you use multi-panel. And then other times, you know, you're gonna use dark humor. And then other times you're gonna do whimsical humor. And the reason, because every time you do a cartoon, you wanna be surprising. You will keep it surprising for yourself, but you wanna keep it surprising for your viewers and readers so that they will keep on coming back. I mean, I've done 11,000 of these things. I want people to keep on coming back and wanting to read. And you talked about the coronavirus here. This is um, a cartoon that I did, um, what was it, 2020. So we're just just still in the whole business and uh, a simple cartoon, but also talks about uh, climate change, which, you know, we're, we're not even talking about climate change that much. Um, between that and AI and other things going on, we've got a lot of stuff in front of us. So climate change here, uh, this cartoon, we're not responding quick enough on a global fashion. You know, we're doing some things, but it's only not to the level and speed that I would like to have happen. And you can see it here in the cartoon. And uh, yeah, yeah, so this is a fun cartoon. What competition is, is this? It's the uh, human race. And this goes back to the AI that we were talking about before, the challenges. Uh, I, again, with AI, you can see this fast moving car. Again, this is a multi panel. Vroom, vroom, vroom. And the, and the police car gets past it, you know, and, uh, and then what the police, you know, that is trying to police the internet, trying to police AI. We're always way be far, uh, be far behind. And uh, this cartoon says that we're not at all equipped with how to manage um, the deal with this new um, challenger. All right, so it looks like we have lots of things to do as a cartoonist. If you guys are all going to be cartoonists, you got to take in a lot of information from all the places you can. TV, radio, go to your local library. All these places have information that could be important for you. Um, but then you have to come up with an idea. And so that doesn't mean that comes easy. So what I do is I get a lot of paper and I start sketching out ideas. And sometimes when you do an idea, it seems like it's, funny when it's in your head, but when it gets down on paper, it's not that funny. So I do lots of them, lots of sketches. And I'm gonna show you a sketch here um, of a cover I did for The Economist. Man, it must be about 16 or 18 years ago, but I wanna follow it from its beginning sketch to its final product. So um, what had happened was, is that there was a, The Economist, my publication, was coming out with a um, big cover story about um, taxing the rich. Um, and they said that it would be okay to tax the rich if the money was going toward a sound 
um, you know, economic benefit, you know, um, paying down deficits or something like that. So um, they said, well, can you come up with an idea, Ken? So I thought about it and I thought, well, what is something that kind of connotes um, rich people in a comic way? And I thought, fox hunting, perfect, perfect metaphor. And so I came up with this sketch, which um, looked really clear, doesn't it, so far? You can really see what's going on here. But anyways, the next sketch is even better. Okay, so this is the next sketch. All right, it's looking a little bit better, but it's also looking a little more confused. Uh, then, so I got down to the next sketch, and you and uh, now you're beginning to see things emerge. Okay, in the upper left, you can see there's horses and guys with horns, and down on the lower right, there's some more people being chased with bags of money. And eventually, now you can see the sketch kind of coming together here, like this. Now, meanwhile, I'm sending these sketches back over to London and so on. They're taking the sketches and they're working on different concepts for the uh, captions for the cover. Um, you got one there, you can see it, it gets more and more refined. And uh, and finally, after all has been agreed upon and I start painting this thing, it takes me about another 12, 13 hours to paint. Um, I add a caricature of, of uh, Barack Obama in there. And this is what the final artwork looked, up, looked like. You can see all the characters down there running and the horses jumping and so on. And when it appeared on the magazine cover, it looked like this. And all of that process, starting from that little scrubble of a scratch at the very beginning to this point, it was a total of 36 hours. So that's the kind of timetable we have to operate. And that's the other thing about being a cartoonist, guys. You have unforgiving deadlines and you have to produce all of these things on a, on a deadline, all these beautiful things that use all these different tools. And, and then you, you have a blank piece of paper, go, got to do it, finish it up. And guess what? Tomorrow, another be blank piece of paper for you to get going on your next job. All right. So I think that's, that is it for me. I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to see if I can escape here and uh, stop share. And here we are. Fantastic. Yeah, that's just that is a real uh, a real adventure trip down uh, into your world and and our world that you are inhabiting and helping to shape. Um, you point out the this kind of this sometimes these misperceptions take hold. You point out, I think you said Thatcher's nose, uh, and then it kept being repeated. And uh, you made me think of, you know, Trump's small hands. I, we have no idea. I don't anyway. Uh, but that's that's now part of that, you know, image of him. And then it, it reminded me of uh, uh, and how this affects the people that are being lampooned. You know, well, I'm 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 huge. I'm you know, I'm massive. I, this is not me at all. You know, and, and reacting to these things. And I remember uh, uh, George Bush, the first uh portrayed by her block carrying a purse a and it was a kind of a you know implication that he was slightly effeminate and so it seemed like he was going to extra links to show that he was not you know his, his power boats and his invasions and stuff i just wonder how you register the reactions to to these images that they, they must really hit the people that are you know being being characterized or mischaracterized in their own minds. And and do you have like a, uh, an objective when you, when you do this? Well, I'll, let me step back for a second is that it's interesting getting politicians reaction to the cartoons. And, um, you know, remember I'm a cartoonist here in Baltimore. So the, you know, the state of Maryland, the governor, the mayors, they look at your cartoon. And in my state, I am the only satirist, right? And so they look at these cartoons with great um, interest and concern because the one person who can, you know, formulate their uh, personal, uh, their public persona and twist it, you have this kind of immense power is a hard word to say, but you have this great area of influence. Now, the further you work away from that, however, is that when you get to a president and to global uh, politicians, that... Um, it's harder to feel that you're making any impact there. And even today, I'm going to suggest that it's harder than ever because of there's so much disinformation and information. You have these bubbles 
of which people ecosystems of um, information that people reside in and they're only going to see artwork or um, articles or any information that kind of agrees with their kind of perspective on life. And so you're not going to get that challenging kind of perspective. You showed earlier on a picture of Thomas Nast, he'd done of, of um, Boss Tweed. Back in those days, you know, pre-internet, pre-television, pre-radio, where the newspapers, the printed material was the most important um, piece of visual, um, part of the visual menu that's on people's uh, resides with people in any given week. And so the cartoon there was so powerful because they, that, you know, there was no color pictures. There's no photographs, really. This etched, beautiful uh, imagery resided with people such a long time. Today, it's much more difficult because my cartoons, which you can see a bunch of them are black and white, a bunch of them are in color. They're competing with moving images. They're competing with sound. They're competing with even weather maps, which are you know these dynamic things, and so it's harder to uh, you know to, to have that ability to um, change the public's mind about a politician today than ever before. Um, but that's gonna not gonna stop me because I think it's important that um, tickling times like this when um, the public public the population is desperate for explanation and desperate for um, validation or whatever is that yeah, the cartoons have a real power because people don't always read this long articles, but they'll spend five or 10 seconds to read, look at the cartoon. Indeed. Uh, I mean, this is, you, you talked about, you know, the, the time invested and the time set. Just did a message in in a couple of seconds or maybe a little longer that would you know save you from having to read a you know a, a ten minute article and so people are, are attracted to that just for the economy of it I think in part um, so we've got we've got uh, an idea from Dave uh, mm -hmm. have you considered doing one describing us I suppose he means the U S uh, in a barrel tipping over Niagara Falls after the election, when we know the world is tilting, we have no have no idea how far we're going to fall. Yeah, that's a good that's a good image. You know, I like that. Um, and um, what I love is too about uh, Dave's e e exploration with this is this under I this idea that uh, that uh, metaphors and um, visual packages have ability to, to encapsulate so many different things. And uh, what I, one of the, I, you know, I haven't done a Niagara Falls after the, uh, for a long time. Um, one of the things about that image in particular, why I might show, I, well, I certainly couldn't use it with the economist because being a global publication, but with um, in the Baltimore Sun is that um, I might be more tempted to use a boat going over because the the idea of people who used to you know get in barrels right um, and go over Niagara Falls seems to be rather dated or people just don't you know a lot of our young readers have no idea what that's all about so you might have a kayak going over or something you know more contemporary but I um, I I I think that's a really good idea so if I might steal it on I will give Dave uh, you know a, a tip of the hat. <laughs> the attractive idea of the barrel is that it's willful. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Pat uh, uh, asks, uh, as an amateur photographer, does horizontal versus vertical have a subtle, subtle meaning in the political cartoon? Does it uh, matter if the panels are sequential, left or right, or top to bottom? You pointed out the importance of the uh, the upper uh, left-hand corner, I think, on one of them. Uh, what what about uh, Pat's query here about vertical, horizontal? Uh, they're really good. Uh, I've done cartoons and papers that are both vertical and horizontal. Horizontal offers more options, for sure. Um, but you can also imagine that in, in Japan and, and other places in the world, they don't read from left uh, to right. They read from right to left. And so that the way you design your, your panels and the way you... Um, you, you can't just flip them because for some reason it just doesn't you know quite work as easily so you actually have to reconsider uh, things when you're uh, going to be doing it that way 
Um, so, I mean, absolutely, because the way we consume things, there's all sorts of um, elements that um, affect it and affect it in ways that we don't even know. Um, and so the horizontal cartoons going down means that you're going back and forth like this while the, well, sorry, that's the vertical rather, but the horizontal ones, you're going more leisurely. Um, I'm working on a graphic novel now and most everyone here who's, who works at a library familiar that graphic novels are very popular amongst our you know, youngsters today. And that because it's a, um, you know, a more uh, vertical format, um, the timing and the way I operate my 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 um, layout of it is is um, I have to be very careful. Interesting. I mean, looking forward to that. Um, who mm -hmm. who influenced you earlier? I mean, did you did you, were you influenced by Marshall McLuhan or you know what what people really kind of pointed you in the, in your direction? So um, I think it started basically by um, influences in the cartoon realm rather than on the journalism realm. Um, I, you know, I, I stayed and worked in the US right up till I was 21, 22, just graduated from university. That's when I went abroad. And it was when I was abroad that the satire element became much more important to me because uh, anyone here who's ever traveled abroad understand that you, you as an American are held personally responsible for everything that goes on in this country. And so I was, yeah, I took much more of an interest into um, understanding America and what was going on at the time. And I also had this fabulous passion for cartoons. And my passion started with Dr. Zeus, which I think is a great place to start when I'm a kid, then through Looney Tunes as a, you know, as a young teenager. And then I began to like um, artists like David Levine and got to fam be familiar with uh, Thomas Nass and other people. So when I had this, passion for cartooning added to my new passion, newfound passion about politics and so on. I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could become a political cartoonist and mix them both together? Wonderful. Um, you mentioned uh, that uh, there's a proliferation of so-called political cartoonists. Uh, you know, everybody mm -hmm. sits down with a pencil. They have, they have a publishing vehicle, right? We have the internet, so anybody can publish any they want to but you uh you make me wonder uh, have you tried or do you have any knowledge about how how well ai is doing at creating political cartoons that's a great question so we did a little test or a little we we started to do something with the economist that uh we're probably going to pursue more now that the u.s election is over we were decided we're going to do a thing cal versus ai where we get um you know a bunch of keywords um, together. And our first experiment was with um, the uh, Paris Olympics, where they would, um, you know, say opening ceremonies, baguettes, um, you know, sunny day and um, gymnastics, let's say. And then I was to do a cartoon, you know, imp improv a cartoon using all those uh, devices. And then we would send it out to some AI engines and let them have a go at it as well. And we thought at first it would be really interesting to at least get a marker for where AI is now and to see where it goes over time. And my idea is, I mean, one of the things that, that is we described, there's so many elements that go into a good political cartoon, is that they could do one that was okay, still kind of looked like it was done by AI, it had a harder time with the humor elements of it. And um, so I, I think I'm safe for a little while with this sort of thing. But there's like this, you know. I also know that my 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 uh, business. There was a time, particularly when we had a lot of cartoons, that and when a certain news story broke, I knew how about twenty five or thirty percent of the people would do what cartoon they would do, because they would use that bit of a metaphor and they'd take that bit and put it over here and all. And that way, they uh, maybe it was they wanted to get an early finish so they get around a golf man. I don't know. Or sometimes it could have just been that that was the you know, best idea that we could come up with. And so um, AI can do that. You know, it can grab, you know, give me this news story with these 10 things going on and I'll pull these things together. So um, yeah, I think that it's going to have an, have an effect. Um, but I, I think that because you, you look at my style, the drawing style, it's very, um, personal to me, I think it's going to be pretty hard to replicate a Cal exactly, but, you know, let's see how good, where it goes. You don't want to replicate, but you're wondering if it can 
you know, create anything new. Uh, that's right. Yeah. That's open question. Yeah. So, um, uh, Sarah asked, what can you tell us what the graphic novel is about? Mm. So, the graphic novel is, um, I'm going to give you the log line because you guys probably know log lines. You know, there's one sentence that, you know, these booksellers say that that whatever or movies are made from a single log line. And let me see if I can remember it. So, again, this is a middle school graphic novel. And it was when um, middle school siblings, Dan and Tally Green, learned that the abduction of their school principal is linked to a war on humans. They rally a posse of colleagues and magical creatures on an epic quest to save both their principal and mankind. Uh -huh. Magic versus technology. It That's is. it. And so it's a, got a very large environmental um, story. I mean, under underpinning the whole thing. And it's partly it, it's inspired by the fact that, you know, this young generation, the next generation um, are already having large anxieties about um climate change and um it may seem overwhelming that you know they will not be able to manage this how do they you know something so grand and so big and the this the book is a kind of a cheering section to encourage them that if everyone works together they can they do a lot more than they think they can and that um you know this is a challenge that unfortunately my generation left to them and we are we're we're cheering for you i i'm with you on that and i am in that generation and and have been a long time consumer of cartoons and comics and <clears throat> animations, you know, back as far as I can remember, I'm you know, TV generation and and comics. I, I'm sure I read 90 plus percent of all comics up to the mid 60s. I mean, right. ask me, I can I'm sure I, I can answer something. Uh, mm -hmm. Sean uh mentions there's certainly the expectation that we're aware of all the national issues and people look up to the u.s statements on a variety of issues uh i don't know sean do you want to amplify well it's it's maybe it speaks to what you were talking about the kind of the feeling the responsibility when you travel outside yeah. of the u.s i i felt that i studied in in europe in 1970 for a summer and I was, you know, kind of antagonistic about the policies of the country at the time and the general, you know, adult materialistic population, all that. I get to Europe and then people are just piling on. I'm going, well, we'll hold it right there. You know, it's not we're not all bad. Right. I yeah. started feeling yeah. a completely new new experience for me that yeah. you know, I was defending it and feeling a little bit responsible. And that never went away. I remember feeling that very powerfully in the 2004 election, uh, having being from Texas and roughly a similar age as George Bush, I felt responsible that, you know, that for what he did. I, I don't know what it means, but mm -hmm. anyway, we well, still, the, you know, one of the things I discovered in when I get in taxis in London and the black cabs, right, is that so many of them had a much greater understanding of America and its politics than most average Americans did. And it says that um, to some degree that, you know, um, Americans are woefully uneducated uh, about all sorts of elements of our form of government, how it works and so on. And that's what I love that our libraries have this opportunity of um, having a common a common thread of, of truth and understanding that we can all agree upon of what's when things need to be done and what uh, what exists in the country. And um, you know, the more that, that we collectively take advantage of that, um, I think the better off our whole society will be. I, I could not agree more. And I, I, I take that at the global level, not just at the national level. And uh, let me see if I got this right. We, we're gonna close up here and I'm gonna ask you for kind of a, a, a closing uh, remarks. Uh, yep. uh, libraries are an island of truth in a, a typhoon of disinformation. Did I did I get yeah. that right? Yeah, that sounds okay. good. Hey, whose idea? Who that said that? That sounds really smart. Oh, well, maybe I can claim it myself. <laughs> Nobody will know. <laughs> uh, Cal, please. Any anything you want to leave us with? I mean, this has just been fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll leave you with this: is that um, back in the uh, about a decade ago, um, you know, some some gunmen walked into Charlie Hebdo and um, 
you know, shot down a whole bunch of uh, cartoonists and other members of the staff and thought by those actions that they were going to stop um, humor and satire on subjects they didn't want. And that's one of the things that you can't tap down um, satire and a freedom of expression. Um, and in fact, we're going to, we may find that in our society, um, well, we're incredibly lucky, you know, we, um, it, you know, most places in the world, 90% of the world, we couldn't get away with the cartoons that we do here. It's a, you, you can not even imagine them drawing their own head of state, which we take on for granted. And if we was living in that, uh, in those worlds, um, you guys would probably be arrested for just being on this on this uh, uh, on this webcast, and I disappear never to be seen again. And so we are all in this. We all have this fabulous thing that we take for granted, and that our satire is in the front line of freedom of expression in this country. And so I would like to think that you guys, as my brothers and sisters, that when politicians of any stripe try to threaten our ability to make comments about our own politicians, that you will come arm in arm with me to make sure that doesn't happen. I'm in brother. Absolutely. Well, that's a, that's a marvelous closing notion and a call. And uh, I, this has been one of our, our best sessions, Cal, uh, your, your breadth of experience and expression and your humor and your, your good nature just all come through. And so, so, so powerfully, and we really appreciate you taking the time for us today and hope you'll come back. We well, really I'd love like to see you guys in person. That would be more fun. Yeah, that would be more fun. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll have to figure out how to do that. Well, well maybe you come visit your office in, in uh, London. I'm sure you get there from time to time. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay. Well, with that, I'm gonna close the recording All right now. Thanks everyone, come back. We've got some interesting things coming up. Keep an eye out and we'll see you next time.